Thank you, Suncoast Singers, and I hope you'll join us this evening at 7 o'clock for our Vespers, where we'll get to hear more from the Suncoast Singers and others. We'll have a very blessed evening together. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this day, the call to worship, the privilege of praising you, giving our lives and all other parts. So now, Lord, I'm asking, anoint our time together as we open the Word, touch our lives, make us ready to be used for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I've entitled my message this morning, The Prophet and the Doctors for God and CME. Now, this message won't be exactly what I envisioned it when I was planning, but it will be, I trust, what God wants it to be. If we could bring that slideshow up. Thank you. The Bible says, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is King Jehoshaphat speaking. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. I want to praise the Lord this morning for the prosperity he has brought to this church, to its people, to its programming, to its finances, It's only the beginning of what I think God wants to do. But I can tell you after 30-some years of ministry, I have never found myself without the growing prosperity of the Lord because of the faithfulness of the leaders of the churches I've been in to believing in the prophetic, inspired direction of God. And this morning, I want to assure you that if the institution you're leading is struggling, it's because you've moved to the left or the right. God told Joshua, don't move to the left or the right. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You'll prosper in everything you do, and nobody will be able to stand against you. Now, we are living in an age in which we want data and scientific proof for everything we do. But the Bible says we're going to have to believe there's a God. We're going to have to live by faith, because without faith it's impossible to please Him. If the great cosmos, if the physiology of our own person... If the amazing beauty of this earth is not enough to awe you into reality that it's not an accident, it's a divine gift to humanity, then you might want to stop this afternoon and take a look around. The more we learn about biology and physics, the more we learn about the the minutest structure that puts the building blocks together of this world and this universe, the more we must stand in awe that no myriad billions or trillions of years could create this It's been made on purpose by a divine architect whose name is God. This morning, that same God is looking for a group of people that will trust in the presence of the Holy Spirit to give divine direction. And while we are enemies, pilgrims in this land, we are especially dependent not on the great strategy of great human minds, but on the presence of God in our midst. And if Jehoshaphat could go out with the choir members saying, let us go first, then we can go into this world in its final chapters of secular godlessness, believing that we can be the head and not the tail for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Now, when we start to look at the experience of God's people, we need to remember this prophecy written in the very first year that there were uh, courses held on the campus of the Garland and Ferguson Farm. The first year of the university, Emmanuel Missionary College was in the jail, and it was in the courthouse just a little bit here to the south of this church. But the very first year they're on the campus, Ellen White has this understanding of the campus and its future, and the teaching and ministering opportunities will be there. In due course of time, she writes, a sanitarium will be erected at Bering Springs, not to compete with any other sanitarium, but to help represent our work in clear, straight lines and to give the students an opportunity of learning how to care for the sick. Now, it's important to minister to people, but it's important for us to understand that while we're ministering, we are being changed. Our young people can't just have the lid opened up and information put in. We believe in formative education. And the compassion of the heart is developed by acts of compassion. And dealing with the sick and ministering to those who are ignorant about the laws of life, helping them regain their health is a door of opportunity 
for introducing him to Jesus, the creator, healer. We believe as a church that there are two primary ministries that will be in place at the very end of time. One will be the publishing work where we will be going door to door with our faces lit up by the glory of Jesus with hope, not fear, with confidence, not cowardice. We will be going door by door ministering to people in the final act of credibility. You can find anything on the internet, but when somebody in an age of risk takes a little bit of confidence and courage to go door to door to get the truth out, we'll be back to one-on-one communication, the publishing work. The second thing that's going to be operating is our ministry to the sick, the ministry of healing, the right arm of the gospel. I considered this morning tying my right arm behind my back while I preach this sermon, but I need it. I talk with my hands, and the truth of the matter is we need it, and we need to be preparing for it. So whether it's the right arm revival in November, or whether it's the immersion program next April, or whether it's metabolic mastery later this summer, These are just beginnings, significant and powerful beginnings. But our church is called to ready itself to find its way to hearts and minds through acts of compassion. Now, it's important for us to understand how risk fits in. I'm putting up a couple greenhouses here. You know, agriculture is a big deal. And when I was a much younger man, probably 20 years ago, I believe that we should be practicing some agriculture at one of the two schools I helped give oversight to, Indiana Academy and Cicero Adventist Elementary. Now, I didn't have a lot of money. The church didn't have a lot of money. And I always believe in in, uh, seeking the Lord and taking a few risks. So I got online and I bought some greenhouses. They were at an auction. They were used. They actually belonged to a Walmart in northwest Illinois. I was in central Indiana. I thought to myself, after I bought the greenhouses for a great price, I'm going to go get them. So I took my youngest son with me, old gold Chevy pickup truck I had, tandem axle trailer, and we headed up Interstate 74. It was probably about a five-hour trip away. And when I finally got to that Walmart in northwest Illinois, I drove my truck around back after discovering where the dismantled greenhouses were, and I was overwhelmed. I needed a semi-truck to haul all that stuff away. It was late in the day. I had anticipated something a tad bit smaller. To my great relief, after I finally abandoned the concept that I was going to get them back, Lemuel Vega and Christmas Behind Bars said they would pick them up for me on a return run from one of their ministries. Those came back to Indiana Academy. I wish we would have gotten use out of them. We did not. But I want you to understand something. Our pioneers took risk. We're going to have to take risk. That was a risk that never materialized, but I wasn't sad that I took it. John Paul Jones, the great Navy veteran of our country, said, he who will not risk cannot win. But friends, with God, when we're in his will, we are not risking. Now, I have before you this morning a book. This book is an older book now, but it was brand new when I heard about it. In the mid-1990s, I was a member of the North American Division Committee, and I would drive my little dark blue Nissan Sentra back and forth between central Indiana and Silver Springs, Maryland. On the way home from one of those meetings, I can remember traveling through western Maryland, and I was listening to National Public Radio, and they were interviewing a lady by the name of Deborah Myers. She had written this book. The interview was so amazing that even though I was anxious to get home, I pulled my car off the interstate because as I was going through the mountains, I was losing the signal. This lady was saying amazing things. She was saying, and she was a teacher in Harlem, New York, she was saying that your school needs to be small enough to where you know all the names of all the students and you can tell when somebody got a haircut and you can comment on it. And she was talking about amazing things like taking agriculture and using it to reshape the character and soften the dynamics of these hardened inner city kids. She referenced to the Heifer Project. Now, when when I was listening to this, I thought I have to get a copy of this book. On the front side, it says a fiery manifesto for the salvation of public education. Whenever I hear somebody in the secular arena who has finally caught on to the ideas that we've had for a century or more, and it's getting a little traction in the airspace of our social and media networking, my ears prick up because sometimes Seventh-day Adventists are very slow to take any 
steps of faith. Sometimes they're very slow to step out and do something different. It's almost like we have to be affirmed by the world before we're ready to do anything different. But that's not how God set it up. And if you want to be the head and not the tail, you're going to have to go ahead of the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Where we stand today is on the cusp of a great opportunity. Now, if you look at some of what she says, just about every page of the book has something worth reading. It doesn't mean she's right on everything. She said, we saw children being driven into dumbness by a failure to challenge their curiosity, to build on their natural drive towards competence. Building on a natural drive towards competence. That sounds to me like what Piaget would call industry over inferiority. It does seem to me like you're going to have to do more than just open the lid and put information in. Also, when I think about the natural interest and curiosity, I think about good old Harper Bell saying, why bother memorizing anything you're not interested in? Well, the goal is not to find a very narrow band of things for them to learn. The goal is to make whatever you're doing interesting. She also goes on to say, academic, it's just a word, friends tell me. Why get so hung up on it? But just a word can cause a lot of damage. Academic has various specialized and very loaded meanings, also slippery ones. It, it's, first of all, ubiquitous, which means it's everywhere. And it sends subliminal messages, often unintended, that we aren't aware of. And I want to assure you, there's no Seventh-day Adventist school who doesn't want their kids to be smart and to learn. But any Seventh-day Adventist school who thinks that the word academic is the main definer of what they're doing has a serious missional misunderstanding. Unintended. Art and music, for example, are not academic unless we sever their connection from performance from doing. I want to remind you, friends, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in the hand. We believe in the head. We believe in the heart. When there's no doing in education, there's a diminished amount of learning. So if we can sever music and art from doing and just talk about it, then it's academic. She doesn't really like that thought. Neither do I. Then we can have what's now called academic art. But why is doing non-academic? Now, there's a question for us all to think about. Since when has doing not been academic? Or do we draw these very artificial lines to separate those who might have a more mental proclivity than a natural, physical, spatial ability? Very good question. And why is art worthier of school, why is art worthier of school time when it's academic than when it's not? And why is science at least four times more important than even academic art? All right? You got a little sarcasm coming out from this innovative teacher. I once figured out that there are more jobs in New York City for people with advanced musical or artistic degrees than for those with advanced calculus. But you see, I've fallen into the trap of assuming school is vocational. Now, let's pause here just a little bit. And let's go to the first page of the book of education. It says that the goal of education is to prepare students for the joy of service here and now and the higher joy of the greater service to come. Now, when we forget that our training is to make them practical people, in other words, when we divest education from purpose, we end up with informational education, not formational education. In other words, we can consider ourselves a success if they score really high on some standardized testing. But for Seventh-day Adventists, we've never believed this. And we don't even believe that everybody should sit in a college classroom. And by the way, college is losing a little bit of its luster in the educational discussions that are going on. There's lots of people who never need to go to college to be tremendously successful. And while we don't want to diminish the value of college for certain things, we certainly don't want to make anybody feel like they're a second-class intellectual if they didn't go. The truth of the matter is, is that there's purpose in learning. And when the kids don't see the purpose, they don't want to learn. And when they see the purpose and they understand the goal, all of a sudden we have secular pro prophets in the educational field starting to sound like the prophet who started us on the educational journey. You see, the goal is to teach people to serve. Yes, education must have meaning. Of course, it's tied to vocation. Okay, which do more citizens get pleasure from? Which leads them to improved habits of citizenship. I'd be hard put to claim calculus the winner over music on any such measure of real life utility. I suspect that until we accept the challenge to find a better criteria for defining what's worth knowing, we're going to keep going round in circles. Now, I'm here to tell you today, we don't need the world to tell us what's worth knowing. I'll say that again. 
We don't need the world to tell us what's worth knowing. We should be teaching our students the things that are worth knowing at the end of the age. And while they should know how to do all kinds of things from engineering to education, they should know most of all that not long from now, a little cloud half the size of a man's hand is going to appear in the eastern sky. And people are going to look up and say, lo, this is our God. We've waited for him. Or they're going to say, rocks and mountains, fall on me. We get to decide what we're teaching. We get to decide what we're preparing them for. We get to decide if we're making them an army of youth that can't be shut down, that are marching in complete unity to the tempo of the master's call and cadence. Yes, it's ours to decide. And wouldn't you know it, Ellen White would suggest that we need to weed out everything that's not worth knowing in our education. But if we need the affirmation of the world, we might be missing out on the power of his ideas. It's interesting, we come along, this teacher in Harlem will break the schools down into little units. She'll turn them into families. She'll motivate them through relationships. And I need to read just a little bit more out of this, if you don't mind. I want to read this page right here, page 30. She says, the big mindless high school, no matter how dysfunctional it is, has its fans, including the kids. When we talk with school officials and local politicians about restructuring large high schools, the first thing they worry about is, okay, listen to me, what will happen to the basketball or the baseball teams, the after-school programs, and the other, here's a little educator sarcasm, and the other side shows. That, the heart of the school, its capacity to educate is missing seems almost beside the point. Furthermore, furthermore, listen to this sentence, we've glorified a teen culture that's out of control and adultless. Everybody should be paying close attention. We've always believed in cross-generational experiences. We believe the bond between the teacher and the student is similar to the bond between the first teacher, the parent, and the child. And we believe we're to leverage all of these things between the home, the school, and the church. Yes, there's power out there for those who dare to risk and dare to be different. This book, which I have a copy of right here, is unique. It was written by W.A. Spicer, who was one of our early uh, General Conference presidents. On the front of the cover, it says, our story of missions for the general public? No. For the church? No. It says, our story of missions for colleges and academies. Now, everybody listening to me here needs to know, curriculum is fluid. It changes all the time. These kind of things need to come back into the curriculum. Our students need to know what these books say. And by the way, if you'd like to get a copy, it's still available as an e-book. You can get one. Let's go to the next book. This book here, printed in 1956, reprinted in 1960, was, was also a curricula book in our educational system. And it took you all across the world to all of our divisions, the educational work, the medical work. It took you to the publishing work. It took you through all the phases of the development of our church in so many places. And this morning, I want to read just a little bit to you out of it. It tells the story of... Uh, one of the colleges that grew up in Zimbabwe. And of course, we have a couple of our employees here that are from Zimbabwe. It says, the first efforts to reach the natives made in 1893, this is Central Africa, Southern Africa, when Elder A.T. Robinson arrived, acting under instructions from the General Conference, arranged an appointment with Cecil Rhodes. Here he is right here. And by the way, Cecil Rhodes was sent to South Africa as a 17-year-old because he had bad health. They wanted him to improve. It turned out the man had an amazing proclivity for business. He started trading in diamonds, and before he was all done, he had virtual monopoly on the diamond trade in the world. The company that is his legacy still exists, the De Beers Diamond Company, and still processes close to 30% of all the rough diamond trade in the entire world. He happened to be the premier of the British government and head of the South Africa company. So I want you to see... A.T. Robinson going to see him. And this is what this, these few paragraphs in this wonderful curricula book for our kids, which every one of them should read, because the last thing we need, the main thing we need to fear is that we forget the way the Lord led us in our past. 
So he gets an appointment with Cecil John Rhodes, premier of South Africa, to request land for a mission station. He was somewhat uncertain of the outcome, for he had heard that Mr. Rhodes, this man right here, was opposed to foreign missions. But the next sentence is almost as if it was written for Ron Kelly in a six-part series on education, because it says, the minister presented his argument basing his appeal on the industrial phase of the missionary project. This would become the place of Seleucy College. Rhodes continued writing while the missionary was talking. But at the end of the interview, he folded the paper, sealed it in an envelope, and handed it back to A.T. Robinson. He said, hand this to Dr. Jameson when you get to Bulawayo. Dr. Jameson was the administrator of the territory being developed by the British South Africa Company. Of course, Elder Robinson was interested in the envelope, but there was no way of finding out its contents until it was opened by Dr. Jameson. With the help of Peter Wessels and Alvin Drilliard, and by the way, if you've been listening to this series of sermons, I just need to remind you, this is the late 1890s. Alvin Drilliard is married to Mrs. D, Mrs. Drilliard, who husband will die during the last year of McGann and Sutherland's ministry here, and she will go down to Madison to help start the college. So I just want to connect the family dots of our Adventist adventurers and missionaries. So there they are, Peter Wessels, Alvin Drilliard, A.T. Robinson. They fitted a covered wagon with a team of 16 mules for the six-week journey to Bulawayo. You want adventure? Work for God. You want to be out on the cutting edge of making life better for this world? You want to make a difference? Work directly for the church for God. If you need to go out on your own pioneering as a supporting ministry, go ahead and do it. But make God first, Eric B. Hare would say. When the group arrived, they gave the letter to Dr. Jameson. After reading it, he asked how much land they wanted. Peter hesitated. He said, well, doctor, the facts are we ought to have 12,000 acres, but it will depend upon the terms upon which we get it. Terms, quoted Dr. Jameson. Rhodes commands me to give you all the land you can make use of. Do you want better terms than that? I encourage you to go to Wikipedia today and look up Seleucia University. What you're going to see, it's located in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and it still has 12,000 acres. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Now, Ellen White is no doubt the original motivator for all of our educational efforts. Now, I want to take you to the next chapter. There happens to be this little university down in Cornbong, uh, New Wales, Australia, called Avondale. Anybody ever heard of it? Avondale. I want to tell you how it was gotten. It says, on one occasion, in address to the students of the school, before there was an Avondale, Mrs. White called attention to the mission fields of China, India, Africa, and the islands of the sea. She astonished her hearers, okay, the school is almost nothing, it's just begun. She astonished her hearing, hearers by declaring that students trained in the Australian school would be sent as missionaries to all of these lands, China, India, Africa, etc., to learn difficult language, established churches, schools, printing plants, medical institutions. It all seemed fantastic at the time, but you know what, friends? The book says it proved true. Are you surprised? Meanwhile, Ellen White was encouraging the leaders to plan for a strong educational system in Australia with elementary schools and a college. Think big. Think big, my friends. A committee was appointed to look for a college site. All right? After much searching, the committee found the Campbell Estate with about 1,500 acres of heavily wooded land. The price was attractive, $3 per acre, but the soil was sandy and disappointing to some of the men who were acquainted with the rich soil of Iowa. Now, next sentence, pretty important. The objection was foreseen by Mrs. White in a vision. She saw two men standing by a furrow of soil saying the soil wasn't good. Now, mind you, some of these early pioneers came from Iowa, where they saw the plow turn over these deep black furrows of wonderful earth, and some of those men were with her in Australia, but they didn't have the confidence they needed in divine inspiration. She was shown that if properly worked, the land would yield abundant crops. Now, I want to tell you, I'm not done with this story just yet, I want to tell you that there are always doubters and naysayers wherever you go. And if you can't get used to that idea, you won't make much of a showing for God. I can remember back in Cicero, we had no money. The church was broke. I was young. I was brand new. It was time to put a new roof on the church. I said, we can do it ourselves. 
Oh, I sat through a board meeting. I want to tell you, board meetings with people who don't have faith are the most torturous things you can ever be a part of. But fortunately, there was an older gentleman in that church by the name of Keith Brewer. When we walked out of the board meeting, everybody was worried, if we do it ourselves, what if it'll leak? We walked out of the board meeting, he stopped me, he always said, Pastor, when the professionals put it on, it leaked. And from that time forward, it's like, we're going for it. I want to tell you, we replaced that roof two times in my almost 20 years of being there. Not because it leaked, just because after 20 years, it was about worn out. So when you have these people, the ones who know better, the ones that are too smart to trust God, finally, a deposit was made on the estate, the Campbell estate, 1,500 acres, even though some of the men doubted the wisdom of the purchase. So what did they do with their doubt? Listen, folks, they got an expert. They sought the advice of the government soils expert. The report of the Department of Agriculture, that's pretty prestigious, isn't it? I mean, who would go against them? The report of the Department of Agriculture was that the soil was sour and would require a ton and a half of lime per acre. The Assistant Secretary of Agriculture said that it would be wise to forfeit their down payment and leave it alone. Now, in last or two weeks ago's sermon, I remind you of something Ellen White said. She said, the wheels of nature and providence only roll forward, they don't roll backwards. And I want to tell you, there's always going to be some expert somewhere to say, it shouldn't be done. But we have a little poem hanging in our committee room that says, somebody said it shouldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe it shouldn't, but he would be one who wouldn't say so till he tried. So he buckled right in with a bit of a grin, took off his hat and went to it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. Listen, friends, when you follow God, you don't have to be afraid because God makes a way through the wilderness. So now we have these two good men, probably ministers, who were once farming in Iowa, who go ahead and get their expert and say, mm, we need to back out on this deal. And you want to hear Ellen White's response? Made me think of Pastor Bob Hess, because he says this every once in a while in our committee meetings. When, the, when told this report by her son, Willie, what a great person to tell her, and Elder Daniels, who would become the General Conference president eventually, Mrs. White said, yeah, we shouldn't do it. Is that what she said? No. No. She said, is there no God in Israel that you've gone to the God of Ekron for counsel? Listen, friends, I want to show you a picture. Okay, can I show you a picture? This is what's there today. It's called Avondale. You know why it's called Avondale? Because it has so many streams on it. They said the soil was so poor that a bandicoot would have to pack his lunch to cross from one side of the Campbell Farm to the other. Well, I'll tell you what. God turned it into a productive and fertile place. And today we have a university there. Can anybody say amen? amen. Believe the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye ye prosper. And if our institutions are not prospering right now, it's because we've turned away to the left and to the right. It's because we've given credence to either the statements or stood in the shadow of the gods of Ekron. It's time for us to remember this, that Ellen White, when she started these schools, when she led by God, motivated people. Everywhere she went, she was starting schools. They were not started just as little Bible colleges. They were started with colleges that would put the Bible into practical life, whether you were an engineer or an educator. No, the council is not just for those who would go on to be Bible workers and pastors. The council was for all of those that would be raised up to be a part of the army of Christ. And that means lawyers, and that means doctors. And that means people that are putting wires together and people that are cutting studs and erecting walls or working on cars. Our schools were to bring this amazing integration of the whole person together. And they were never to get so smart that they were smarter than God's counsel through his prophetess. This is where we're at. Now, take your Bible this morning. And let's go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 10. Formative versus informative education. This is a story that everyone is familiar with. It's a smart person, educated by a fairly godless system. He has been listening to Jesus speak, and he doesn't speak like the experts. The Bible tells us that the experts would say, well, it could mean this, or it could mean that. No, Jesus spoke with authority, and people listened to him. The Holy Spirit was flowing to the listeners. The lawyer is listening to Jesus, and he comes to a place where he wants to kind of pin him down. And he asks him a question. 
What must I do, verse 25 of Luke 10, to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Good teacher. He didn't answer the question. I used to tell my kids all the time, I'm not going to do your thinking for you. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Go ahead and do this, and you'll live. Should have been end of conversation. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this story, verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him. He, they went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, mind you, by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And similarly, by chance, a Levite also, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put, put him on his own beast, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him, and on the next day he took out two denarii, which is the equivalent of two days of wage, and he gave them to the innkeeper, and he said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think proved to be his neighbor? The man who fell into the robber's hands. And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do thou likewise. Now, I'm going to just touch on a few very obvious points relative to this story. Point number one, everybody's got a neighbor somewhere, even if you live in the middle of nowhere. The people on this planet are part of a divine and human web of interconnectedness. You should know your neighbors and you should care about them. The problem in Jesus' day was that no good Jew would live by any bad Samaritan. And Jesus needed to make a point. It's the untouchables and the unlikables that are the people you need to care about so they can come into my family. And I'm going to make it very clear to you that your neighbor is anybody you meet who's in need. Now, one of the things you can't miss in this story is that life is just dangerous. Sorry, can't change it. The journey from Jerusalem to Jericho was not an easy or delicate or pleasant one to make. And you might find yourself listening to people who are cursing and swearing and telling you to give up your stuff. And the dust might fl start flying and the fists might start moving and the, the knives and the swords and the staves may start stabbing and slashing. And you might find yourself laying naked in the middle of the road, bleeding to death, hoping somebody might stop and give you a drink of water and put a little something on your wounds. Jesus said there was somebody that would do that. Now, you need to know, looking at the story, that the, the age of Christ was the bottom of the barrel of humanity because even the people who said they were followers of God had no heart for the world. In other words, the churches, the homes, and the schools of Christ's days were utter failures. They had no desire to serve, they didn't want to be contaminated, and they found a religious reason to avoid the compassion that wells up naturally in the heart of every human being. When we look at ourselves today, I think we better take a hard look. If the very first goal of all of our work can be stated on the first page, which is page number 13 of the book Education, first few paragraphs, first chapter, if the goal is to create hearts to serve, but we can't get people to be teachers and we can't get people to be preachers, we might just be failing. It might be that our culture of convenience where we stay home when there's a church program and we don't care if there's evangelism going on and somebody else can go to the mission field and somebody else can give out literature, we might just find ourselves suffocating on our own self-indulgence and the generation that pays the most might be our kids. We better stop and think about this. Because we're living in a strange moment where the amazing blessings of five generations of educational institutions have produced some of the best minds. But I'm wondering now if they're producing the best hearts. And that's not just the job of the schools. It starts in the home. But if service is the goal, then the schools of Christ's day were utter failures. And if service is still the goal, and we can't get anybody to serve the church until they're middle-aged, we might be failing too. We need to stop and say, what's the culture of the Adventist church? 
Not the Adventist school system, but the Adventist home, the Adventist school, and the Adventist church. Do we believe the ends of the earth have come upon us? Do we believe that we ought to gather more, not less, because we see the day approaching? Do we believe we ought to come to get to know each other, to praise the Lord, to encourage each other? Listen, friends, the religious schools of Christ's days had failed. They were informative without being formative. I want you to understand something. The easiest way around formative education is informative education. Get as many degrees as you can get. It doesn't have to affect your character one bit. The other thing I think it's important for us to understand is everybody that passed by this man laying in the middle of the road with the exception of the Samaritan was officially associated with the church. They worked for the church. Does that mean there's an ipso facto? Does that mean there's an automatic relationship that you work for the church and you're not a spiritual person? No, doesn't mean that. If it meant that, there'd be a lot of us, including yours truly, standing behind this plexiglass pulpit this morning who'd be in deep, deep trouble and you'd be in worse because you're listening. But I want to tell you, the opposite is equally true. Just because somebody works from the church doesn't make them spiritual either. And we're living in an age today without being critical, without being negative. We better have our eyes open and say, you know what? Just because it looks like a a duck and quacks like a duck doesn't mean it's a duck. All right? And just because you make it into a promoted position in the institutional structure doesn't make you a godly person. And that's definitely what we're dealing with in this story here. If the priest can say, hmm, not even going to get close, and the Levite could say, well, let's see how bad he is, and neither one of them feels one little iota of compunction to do something about it, we better be paying attention to the fact that as if it went wrong in the days of Jesus, it might go wrong in the days just before Jesus. You need to notice in this story, the Samaritan is not called a doctor, although he does medical missionary work. And you know what? Most of us sitting here today are not called doctors either, although we have a fair share of them here, and I'm so glad for every single one of them. And I'm thankful for the ministry they have to us. But one of the ministries they have to us is teaching us how to do the things we can do that are ordinary and not based on medicine that can help the world be educated, healthy, and happy. And that's what we have with our medical ministry team here. He was a very credible man. He could say to the owner of the inn, I'll take care of you. Here's some money. He was a very busy man. He had responsibility. He couldn't stay and take care of him. But he was going to make sure he was taken care of. Some of you listening to me here today have tremendous responsibilities on you. The Sabbath is a brief little moment of respite in a very, very busy week. This man was no different. Whether or not he worshiped God outrightly and openly, we don't know. But we do know this. He was a man of compassion. The other thing I want you to know is that the ministry of healing is exceptionally inconvenient and exceptionally inglorious, and it's not automatically equated with being in a doctor's office. The truth of the matter is, some of you are going to be in people's homes. I've known people who do foot care for the elderly who can no longer bend over and take care of their own toenails, parish nurses, medical clinics. But more than that, the Adventist Church believes that the ordinary member should understand the basic physiology and the basic treatments that can help a person find their way back to hell. And when faith leaders don't challenge and confront and console and prod and encourage, the community's destined to fold over onto itself and become self-indulgent. Now, I want to go just the last picture or two here before I'm done today. This is the building that was bought on a place called Hill Beautiful. Don't really like the picture. It's old. It's dingy. That building was bought by a consortium of doctors to turn it into a health retreat, but it didn't work. They paid $155,000 for it. John Burden had been looking on the direction of Ellen G. White for a place just like this. She said she had never come upon a place as well-suited for a sanitarium as this one. It was in a little city called Hill Beautiful. Now, I love this drawing. It's an old postcard. But I want you to think of Loma Linda as they saw it 100 plus years ago. A beautiful multi-room facility where they started a sanitarium before they started a college, surrounded by all of these palm trees and these orange groves with the backdrop of the mountains. The year was 1906. Nowadays, it used to be we knew the university by its three cylindrical 
uh, the medical institution by its three cylindrical columns. I can remember seeing those. I mean, somebody could show me those, and I would say, that's Loma Linda. Now they've built a much larger part of the complex, and it dwarfs the three cylindrical towers. I have a daughter-in-law that's finished her third year of medical school there. I'm very thankful for the ministry of this place. And yet every doctor, physical therapist, nurse, physician's, physician's assistant, nurse practitioner, every radiologist, every, every ultrasound technologist, all of you folks today, you need to understand something that when you're getting paid to do this, it's good that you're nice and it's good that you're spiritual, but that's not the summation of medical ministry work. And while it's a good start and we're thankful for it, we've got to be reminded that of whom much is given, much is expected. We're debtors to the world for every advantage we have. And it's not just for those who have chosen medical ministry or medical degrees or a medical trajectory of their life. It's for a church to put its arms around. It's for a church. Ellen White will say that every church ought to have its own treatment room. Whatever happened to that council? She also said that when you separate the medical work from the, the, the ministry work, from the, the spiritual pastoral ministerial side of it, both sides are going to suffer. I'd say we're suffering. And I want to say I'm awfully glad for people like our own doctors and our Dr. Hess who could walk away from a big salary and join with the pastor. We need the pastors, Ellen White said, need to know how to give basic medical treatments and the doctors need to know how to lead somebody to Christ. This is what she says. And it's time for us to come back to living by it. This is who we're supposed to be. We need each other. And this great calling that we have to win the world has an entering wedge in the right arm. Now, I want to end with a little story of encouragement. This is not Sutherland and McGann, but it might as well have been. Because in their middle 40s, McGann was four years younger than Sutherland. So at 42 years of age, they can't get any doctors to come down to Madison. I want everybody listening to me that makes a good wage as a medical person. They can't get any doctors to come down and work for any length of time at Madison College. So they decide they're going to go to medical school. They don't have the money. They have no assurance that everything will work out all right because there's classes on Sabbath. They go ahead and talk to everybody. Most of them say they'll work with them. They start out riding whatever version of public transportation was available, probably a rented car. Eventually, McGann buys a motorcycle. He rides that motorcycle in the winter. He catches pneumonia and almost dies. Finally, they both graduate. Along the way, though, McGann scores a perfect score on one of his tests, and the instructor docks him by 10%. His classmates, non-Adventists, this man must have been a genuine Christian, his classmates protest. Finally, when he does graduate, and I appreciate, I don't know if it was a doctor or nurse that uh, texted me between the services. Finally, at the end of his uh, medical education, he is called to make a presentation on what is called the sphenoid, sphenoid bone, if I've said that properly. The most complicated bone in the body. It has nerves and blood vessels. It's a part of your head. He tells 65 unique characteristics of this, and when it's all done, they give him a standing ovation. I want you to understand, this man will go on to be employed by what we now know as Loma Linda University, which in 1906 started on September 20. All of the staff weren't there. Half of the students weren't there. The start was so poor. Lest you think that our start's going to be glorious and everything's going to work out. No, the new things we're doing are going to have the same challenges. It was such a poor start on September 20, they had to have a second start on October 4, 1906. And finally, a college that starts out being called the College of Evangelists becomes the College of Medical Evangelists. And what I didn't say in the first service is important for you to know, Percy T. McGann is a Christian of such high spiritual caliber and mental ability, he meets all of these leading people while he's going to medical school. They call him to the College of Medical Evangelists because of his connections around the United States of America. He helps the college go from a C-rate rated medical school to a B-rated medical school. Percy T. McGann, the one who turned his back on the cornflake conglomeracy of Kellogg's, 
is a man who helps establish multiple schools for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including Loma Linda University. What I need you all to know this morning is that in due course of time, a sanitarium is to be erected somewhere near this town, not to compete with any other sanitariums, but to help represent our work in clear, straight lines. It's our work. It's not just our medical work. It's our global three angels gospel message work and to give the students an opportunity to have a heart of compassion like the Samaritan on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. There stands among you, Ellen White would say, read this the other night for worship at our house, there stands among you the mighty counselor of the ages, inviting you to place your confidence in him. Shall we turn from him to uncertain human beings? Is there no God in Israel that we have to go to the gods of Ekron who are as wholly dependent upon God as we ourselves are? Here, next sentence, this is the key point. Have we not fallen far below our privileges? Think about it. We have a hundred years of inspired counsel to give us a head start nobody could have ever caught up with. Have we not been guilty of expecting so little that we have not asked God for what He's longing to give? Last thing I'm going to say, the work began in sacrifice. It will end in sacrifice. And that might be the sticking point. Ellen White borrowed $5,000 to start building buildings at Avondale. That's about $80,000 in modern money. Remember I told you Christensen, the business manager for Battle Creek, borrowed $100,000 on his name, and McGann borrowed $100,000 on his name, and Sutherland borrowed $6,000, which in modern day equivalent is about $90,000 to get the publishing work going here. You know, friends, this might be the sticking point. Maybe we're not willing to sacrifice anything. Maybe life's too good for divine intervention. Maybe God's all right with leaving us alone. Maybe there doesn't need to be a sanitarium in Berrien Springs. Maybe somebody else should get the privilege of doing it. Or maybe we should say, Lord, while on others you're calling, don't pass us by. Give us a piece of it, Lord. Give us a part. Create the new pioneers. Make us into the head and not the tail. Give us the faith to take some risk. And may we lead the world to an uplifted Jesus. May we lead the world to Christ through the entering wedge of the health ministry. Hey, we need a new word. Sanitarium doesn't even sound good anymore. But I'll tell you what, you come up with a good word, you forward it on to the church office or to me, and we'll put them in a hopper. We're looking for the right thing to call this. But I'll tell you what, we don't have to worry about competition. All right, let's go back here. We don't have to worry about not to compete with any other sanitarium, friends. I think we've just about gone out of the business of the kind of health ministry Ellen White talked about. And I think the divorce between the ministry and the doctors has paid a painful price. There's other doctors out there that need to be called away from their big salaries. And they need to come take the sacrificial salaries of the pastors. Listen to me. And there might actually be some pastors out there that need to go to medical school or get some more medical training. But I'll tell you what, there's enough training out there that I think our big deal is we're all just living a good life and enjoying things while the world goes to hell in a handbang. And some of us are even buying our country estate so when things get really bad, we can run away and be okay. You're not going to make it. You won't be there. What you're going to really need to survive in the end is the faith journey of this uh, sanitarium and these new schools and the different things. What you're really going to need is know that there is a God in Israel. And if I believe the Lord God, I'm going to be established. And if I believe his prophets, I'm going to prosper. Amen and hallelujah. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn.